Good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last night, my name is Ben. I'm one of many, many people who make uh, Collective possible. Super glad you guys are here. I know people are coming in from, uh, from multiple hours away, so glad you're here. Glad everybody got to travel safely. Um, sorry we scheduled it over race week. We know that hotels are unavailable and incredibly expensive. When we do this next year, wink, we won't schedule it on race week. Um, so mark your calendars, but we don't know what dates. Um, <laughs> we'll get back to you. Uh, and, and we are chatting about adding some potential other guests, people that are friends with this guy, which is dangerous. So um, it's going to be a good time. Uh, we mentioned last night, uh, if, you, if you aren't here, um, we sort of gave a little background on Collective, who we are, why we would host an event like this. Uh, and, and we said we're going to begin this morning with our community statement, which is sort of something that helps us to define the identity of this group of people. Uh, for some people, it's a church. For some people, it's their community. For some people, uh, they think of it as a congregation. So whatever the language is, we're a group of people who are drawn together uh, in the kind of pursuit that we're going to engage in this weekend. Um, and so this, this statement helps to, to sort of um, identify and hone our sense of, of why we do what we do. Uh, that being said, <laughs> Pete gave a great uh, example last night of sort of talking about um, being in denial and uh, the, the idea that, you know, an alcoholic says, I'm not an alcoholic. Um, and they're also the, the person who, without having been asked, volunteer the fact that they're not an alcoholic. And as I'm thinking about that, I'm going, man, we read this community statement every week and nobody asked us. Um, <laughs> so in a sense, but hold on, here's the deal though. In a sense, we're reading it because we're aware that the things in this are not always true about us. But these are the things that we aspire to be. Um, so it's not from a sense of a denial. We're sort of putting this out in front of us and going, we know we're not these people yet, but these are the kind of people that we want to be. So uh, this is the community statement for Collective. We value highly the metaphor of journey. We're different people from different places and backgrounds, representing a multi-generational community, and we have traveled different paths. So we agree not to make assumptions about the person across from us, next to us, or in conversation with us. We challenge ourselves to be sensitive, knowing this community includes a diverse group of people, from lifelong followers of Jesus to those who are just now open to the idea that God might indeed exist. We strive to avoid offense, ask good questions, articulate and explain our responses. We don't assume fluency in the Bible, spirituality, or church language because we believe the message of Jesus is not for Christianity, but for humanity. So we do everything in the spirit of love and grace. At least we aim to. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Rollins. Good morning. I like the fact that he said, we're not in denial, which is exactly what someone who's in denial <laughs> would say, especially if you were there last night, is whenever they say it, when you didn't even ask, right? <laughs> you know? um, yeah, so it, it's great for you guys. Oh. Oh, that's a 47. It's, going to, it's great for you guys to be here. That's a very <laughs> egotistical thing for me to start. So, <laughs> you know, you're very privileged to be here to listen to the wisdom that I have to offer you. The pearls before swine, uh, as I like to say. Um, no, it's, it's uh, you know, great, uh, great to be here. I've been following the work of Collective for a while. I know Ben well. And, um, you know, it's great to be out here. I was always a huge fan of Miami Vice. And so every time I go to Florida, I'm always, like, remembering my obsession with Sonny Crockett. Uh, and I don't know if it was that huge in America, but in Europe, we loved a Miami Vice. And uh, I, the Ferrari Testarossa is, like, still my dream car. So I'm, like, I'm really excited to see if I can actually find one here. But there's, I've not seen one Ferrari Testarossa. I thought you'd all have them, you know? And, <laughs> homage to the show that made Florida famous. Um, so yeah, you know, it's going to be a long day, um, and you've taken a lot of time out to be part of this. So hopefully I want it to be challenging and interesting, and that we can have some interesting discussions. Uh, you know, I usually judge the success of an event not by uh, whether people agree with it or disagree with it, but how much it, conversation it generates. So I'm always happy when, after a talk, if there's lots of people sitting around talking, um, or go to the pub afterwards to continue the conversations. For me, that's, that's the real dream, you know. Um, one, one of the things we're, we tend to do, uh, under the guise, under the name of critical thinking, actually, is when we listen to someone speak, we tend to kind of filter what they're saying and, and you know, agree with some of it and disagree with other parts of it. And, you know, that seems good thinking, you're not simply agreeing with everything. 
But the problem with that is uh, you're starting with a paradigm, a way of looking at the world that you have, that you've built up over years. Uh, in all honesty, a paradigm that you probably had largely before you were even critically thinking. So that's the thing, before you, you're able to think about what you believe, you're already immersed in a language, a culture, and desires and interests. Sometimes you believe because your parents believed something. You take that on. Sometimes it's the opposite. You don't believe what your parents, you know, you're re rebelling against them for some reason. But often it's very hard to actually, you know, critically think about what you believe um, as if you're some tabula rasa, as if you're some sort of blank slate. Our minds are more like a shopping cart that are full of products. And we go into the, the shopping center of ideas, and it's, it's not just about putting stuff in, it's about taking stuff out. So this is kind of like where we are. It's a messy thing. And to agree and to disagree with somebody is kind of to keep your paradigm the way it is. And if you hear something that fits with it, you know, you agree with it. And if you hear something that doesn't fit with it, you disagree with it. But you have a sense of mastery. You're standing over what you're hearing and filtering it. Uh, in philosophy, one of the things you need to do at the very beginning with students is to try to get them beyond agreement and disagreement to the point of being disturbed and shocked and surprised by what they hear, to allow that to uh, filter in and challenge the already existing worldview or system. And, and at the end of that, you might come back to what you originally believed uh, or thought, but you've gone through a process of, of, of testing. And in that way, you, you sit beneath the thinker you're reading or you're listening to. You say, what do I look like to them? Not what do they look like to me, but what does my world look like to them? How do I look through their eyes? And you're able to sometimes see things you wouldn't see normally. The philosopher Heidegger said that you think students know ever or sorry, you think students are there to learn and, and the lecturers know everything and the, you know they're there to teach. But actually in university what you find is the students know everything, right? And it's the lecturers don't, you know. That uh, and, and what the lecturer has to do partly is in the humanities is is to help the student unlearn and and be in a receptive place. Uh, that's the learned unknowing that comes from years of reading and years of study. So sometimes people say, oh, you know, you, you study philosophy to try to, to know things. Um, a little philosophy is like that, actually. You know, do a little bit of philosophy. When I started, when I started philosophy, I already knew everything. I already knew the truth. I just wanted to find evidence that just kind of backed it up, right? Um, but as I got further into it, I realized that it started to break me. Um, and then I realized that a little philosophy, yeah, gives you a sense of mastery. But you know, you really start reading and reflecting seriously, and you enter into deeper, deeper places of unknowing. You realize that actually a lot of our problem is we think we know too much, um, so much that we don't even question it. It's like the, the, the lens through which we see everything. And, um, and it's actually through study that somehow we come to know. And that's, that's why I, uh, was Aquinas, yeah, who after writing the Summa, uh, this huge theological, philosophical text, and he goes to Mass and comes back and says, what I experienced uh, in Mass uh, makes everything I've written but straw, and I shall write no more. But there was a sense of which there was an unknowing that, that was there at the latter part of his life. Um, that in one sense, I think um, it was part of his deep understanding and deep learning, and uh, part of that was coming to the realization of how much he didn't know. So I'm inviting you into a day of, of, of hopefully being challenged and having good conversation um, and looking at things a little bit differently from perhaps you've looked at before. Uh, it's kind of like, this is why, by the way, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for the Irish, you know, that's why the Irish are God's chosen people, right? We love, we love a good fight. We love a good argument, right? You know, and, um, and there was an Irish comedian, actually, who said, war is not conflict. War is the inability to have conflict, right? So in, in a war, what you do is you can't stand to be in a conflictual space, so you just want to kill the other person, right? That's it. You know, you're, you're arguing with your husband or your wife or something, and, and you get to a point where you just want to, you just, you're sort of like, if I had a gun, I'd kill him, right? I mean, obviously, nobody thinks that. But, but the, the idea, but that's, that's the, like, I cannot stand to be in a conflictual space. So war is the, is the attempt to cut off conflict. 
the, so violence, in a sense, that, that eruption of violence is an inability to handle a certain amount of antagonism. And then extreme, there are people who are so conflict averse that they repress all of that. And you go into a church meeting or something and you're talking and somebody says, bless your heart in a way that makes it sound like they want you to die, you know, <laughs> to have a heart attack, right? And you don't know how because they've been really nice to you and you've just had this really nice conversation between the two of you and somehow you've communicated that you hate each other, you know, like, you know. Oh yes, no, that, that dress, you definitely get away with that dress. Uh, you know, or I don't know how, how it works, but you say things that are compliments, but they're not compliments. I, don't, I can't think of an example, but you know, both of these are, are inabilities to stand conflict. And whenever you have that, that space where conflict isn't allowed, either because any conflict is rejected, the war, right? You think differently, get out, right? Or you think differently, just repress it, don't say anything. In those situations, the violence is still there. You can feel it and it erupts in the worst possible times. So what's healthy is that we can have those conflicts. Like in an Irish pub at the beginning of the night, you go and you meet your friend, you're like, hey, how's it going? And a couple of drinks in and you're like, just think the other person's the most amazing person you've ever met. And you're like, I, you, I, wow, you're incredible, you know? You're my kids, you, you, if, I, if I die, you can have my kids. In fact, you can just have my kids, just take them, <laughs> take them. It's their day or yours, right? And then, and then a couple more drinks in, it's like, I, I can't believe I met, how can your mother live with herself knowing she brought you into the world? And you're awful. And then at the very end, it's like, okay, I'll see you next week. Well, I'll see you next week. And yeah, that's it. So, so that, that conflictual space, how do we analyze? And you know, in some psychoanalytic settings, in group work, the thing that you, um, you all agree to is to come back the next week. And that's it. Because you go like, okay, we're gonna, we're, if, if there's a fight, you're not gonna just walk away. Now there's a point where you should walk away when there's loads of fighting, when it becomes abusive in, a, in, a, in an excessive way. But, but you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna be here through the long haul. Uh, in LA, where I'm living at the moment, there's a thing you see, which is like people who are continually uh, going from one relationship to the next. Uh, you know, they've got the honeymoon period, but then as soon as things get a bit tough, they move on. They're always looking for the non-antagonistic, non-problematic, you know, relationship. Uh, and that's the opposite of someone who stays in a relationship that's destructive. Where there's people, you know, where you kind of get caught up in staying in something that's very, very um, violent. But the other side of that is that you cannot contain any conflict at all. And you, you see this in churches as well, you know, where, where people maybe as soon as things get difficult, they move on to another community. It's a similar kind of thing. Uh, a, a psychoanalyst called Beyond, I think it was Beyond, um, said, you know, Children don't need good parents, because none of you are, right? That's it. There's no good parents, and that's part of, a part of life, you know? We're human beings struggling with our, with our various issues. What we need are good enough parents, which is a really nice way to say it, I think, and, and, he, but, and he meant it very, very specifically. Good enough, that's what you need, good enough parents. We don't need good communities. They don't exist. We need good enough communities. Communities that can handle a certain amount of antagonism and conflict. We're not where we're all going to be buddy-buddy. Because some of you are idiots, I can already see it. You know, it's like, it's obvious. Um, you know, but but where I can kind of like deal with that. And either we work it out, or we kind of like go, you know what, we're never going to be friend friends. But hey, we're part of, fa we're family. You know, you don't have to be best friends with all your family members. But you have a kind of commitment to be good enough to bear the other person's burdens and, and, and to, the, for them to have good faith to bear your burdens um, so that, you know, so that we, can, we can help each other and learn to, to live well and, and, and be healthy. So yeah, so that's, that's what we want. I mean, you know, in some respects, that's what I'm talking about all of today is how do we create good enough communities um, in, uh, in families? Um, even in individuals, because we are strangely a community, and even in ourselves. Uh, it's funny, you know, the, the discussions about theism and atheism, or something like that, you know, there's, there's those parts of all of us. There are, there's the atheist in, in, in us, where, you know, we may say, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in God, but there's parts of you that probably don't, days of the week that you don't, or little bits of you, and, and there's someone who says, I know I don't believe in God, but there's little parts of them that do, if things go wrong, and, and, and you know, they, they pray out, and they're not, it's not, 
you know, if you can't make peace with those elements of yourself and, and, and make peace and, you know, have a bit of an argument with those parts of yourself, they'll do violence, they'll, they'll be problematic. And what you'll end up doing is you'll end up fighting people who represent those parts of yourself that you haven't been able to come to terms with. Uh, you see this sometimes, actually, I know some people you know, who have moved from kind of a, a theist kind of position to a, an atheist position, but sometimes they hold their atheism in the same way that they held their theism, and it's weird because you kind of go like, well, you know, you don't believe it. Why are you so angry at, you know, a, a, a theist or whatever? Why are you so angry at this church? And often, now, sometimes there's good reason to be annoyed at a community if there's like, you know, a, a prejudice or something like that. But sometimes you feel, well, I actually think you haven't come to terms with that part of yourself. You know, because, it, it, you know, most of my friends disagree with me. I disagree with me, right? I, only, I think I'm an idiot sometimes, right? So, but that's, that's fun. That's enjoyable. That's part of, like, you know, good friendship is to go in and have a good discussion about politics and, 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 and all of that. If I can't cope with your difference, that's a sign that there's something going on in me. That, you know, not that I disagree with you, but somehow maybe I agree with you, but I haven't found a way of expressing it. I had a, I was in Canada, um, it was a few years ago, and I did this talk in this bar, and near the end, this big guy stood up, and he started shouting at me and, and swearing at me, and, and I was like, I don't know what I was saying, you know, my usual spiel, something about embracing doubt, complexity, ambiguity, you know, the usual. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm a caricature of myself now. Um, but, uh, but he was like, oh, this, is, this is bullshit and all of this, right? And I was like, okay. But I thought, you know, it's near the end of the talk, and it was, we, so we just ended, and I thought, well, I'll go up and see who this guy is. Because he's there, we're in the same room, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit awkward if we don't kind of at least have a bit of a conversation. So, you know, we went, I went up, um, I think he maybe bought me a drink, or I bought him a drink, I'm not sure, but we sat down, and, and he's like, after a bit of small talk, he's like, I'm really sorry about that. You know, he says, like, you know, I, I actually work in the Christian world. I'm a, a, on Christian radio. And he said, and recently I've had lots of questions and lots of doubts. But he says, you know, I'm in this, this world and I, and I haven't, you know, it's hard for me to be able to express those things. And so he says, I'm shouting at you for telling me that I should be doing what he says, but what, what's actually inside me, right? So what, what and, and interestingly, he found a way in his work to talk about that. So he, he actually brought it into his radio station, talked about how he doesn't know if he really believes, and he got various guests in to, to try and convince him, right? And the, and the guy became a good friend of mine. It's a guy called Drew Marshall, and I've been on his show multiple times. He's a great guy. He hates me at the moment. I'm glad this is going live. If you ever watch it, he hates me because <laughs> he invited me onto the show, and I got the time wrong. I got the time right, but it's the time zone wrong. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be invited back onto the show, but for a while, you know, I was on the show, and... and but, but what, what happened was it was like, he wasn't shouting at me. There was something that he wasn't able to express that I was expressing, um, and, and he was shouting at himself. And if I hadn't sat down with him, I wouldn't have discovered that. I had that again in, in a festival called Greenbelt, where I was doing a, an event with a couple of friends, and I was speaking. And after I spoke, I went off the stage briefly, and my friend Podrick, uh, got up and did some poetry. And as I was sitting there, standing down, down at the side of the stage, this woman came up to me and she started like really going at me, really shouting at me. And I was like, I have to go back up, I have to go back up. She's, like, she's really shouting at me. I'm like, I know, I, like, I've got three minutes and then I have to go and finish this thing off, you know, bring, bring the home game, get the hands in the air, get the converts. She's about to sink just as I am. Right? I've got to... <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, I've got to get the private jet fund going. Or nothing like that. So I'm, I'll be back, I'll be back. I went up and finished off, and I came down, and there were people standing around chatting, and we were chatting. But I could see her standing, you know, at the back, waiting to kind of pounce on me. And, and oh no, this is like, I hope this crowd never dissipates, because as soon as it dissipates, she's like, she's going to be at me. Um, and sure enough, after everything, everyone had gone, she comes up to me. And I'm bracing myself. And, and she's like, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And like, you know, she says, I've just gone through a separation and, and got, just going through a really tough time. And when you were talking about, you know, looking at the, the dark things and looking at 
the, 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 the stuff that we'd rather not look at. She said, I got really angry. Because she said, like, I can't open that door at the moment. It's just, it's just so painful. There's so much going on. But she says, but I know I need to. I know I need to find a, sp- a way to do that. Otherwise, otherwise, I'll carry this with me for the rest of my life. And I'm not going to be able to move on and, and have another relationship and, 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 and find a, a second uh, go at life. And, you know, again, it was just this experience of, of realizing that this person who I thought hated me and was going to attack me, when I got to talk to them, realized that, no, they were, they were struggling to find a way to look at some things. There was some stuff in them that they weren't able to bring to the surface, and so it came out in a symptom. Well, why am I saying all of that? I don't know, but hopefully it's useful, right? But it does make sense. Um, Mm. Okay, yeah, in, in relation to that, can we stick on my one slide? I never use PowerPoint slides. I really should use them more. Welcome to the Stalinist Appreciation Society uh, in Delans. Yep, so <laughs> uh, I think this is a good symbol of what I'm talking about. This is a, a poster that was done in 1948 by a young, talented graphic designer called uh, Piotr Golub, I think. And uh, you know, he was working for the state um, Stalinist system. He was just, this is just a regular propaganda poster. You know, it's, 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 everything's beautiful, well-crafted. There's the flag, there's the young soldiers, there's the battleships in the background. Stalin is standing proudly. So the, the poster was made, it was painted, um, I think it was printed, but at the very last minute, it was pulled. Uh, it was sent before the censorship committee, and somebody just gasped and said, this is diabolical. Uh, this, is a, this is a bad omen. And the graphic designer was sent to the gulags and executed. At least that's what we think happened to him. You kind of go, okay, what is it about this poster that is so diabolical? What is it about this poster that caused such a stir in the censorship committee? Well, if you look at Stalin, and you look at how he's uh, standing, in his left hand, he only has three fingers. Right? It's like the Simpsons, right? <laughs> three <laughs> fingers. You're like, well, that's weird. So either he's missing a finger. Oh, there you go. Hey, miracle of technology, eh? Um, or he's hiding a finger, like he's giving the finger behind his hands, right? And that uh, nobody noticed this for ages because it's really, you know, it's in plain sight. It's, uh, it's there. It's not that you didn't see it. You saw it, but most people don't conceive it. They don't actually consciously bring it in. Um, now, the first thing you have to ask is, well, why did this graphic designer do this? Did he, is he just bad at drawing hands? You know, hands are hard to draw, I've heard. Uh, we, we have lots of murals in Northern Ireland, and uh, uh, usually the hands are terrible and the faces, uh, they're, they're really, really bad. But, um, so, so maybe he's just bad at drawing hands. But the problem there would be, he wouldn't just have to be bad at drawing hands, he'd have to be bad at knowing that he was bad at drawing hands. Right? You know, he'd have to not only give Stalin three fingers, but he'd have to like, not know that he'd given Stalin three fingers. Um, and it's kind of strange. But then you go, well, so did he do it on purpose? You go, on, like, Stalinist Russia? You know, you're going to get killed. Probably your loved ones are going to get killed. And it doesn't even mean anything objectively. Isn't it? That's not a symbol that, you know, could mean some sort of political, politically dissident thing. Um, so it seems unlikely that it was intentional. So when you go, like, it seems unlikely that it was unintentional, and it seems unlikely that it was intentional what was going on. And, you know, this is a good analogy for the Freudian slip. The Freudian slip is where we unintentionally do something intentional, the deliberate mistake, a mistake that we make that we don't realize that we're making. Um, so in this poster, you have the, 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 the propaganda, the, the perfection. This is, everything's great, everything looks fantastic. And then you have this one little element that most people don't see, that sticks out and says, something isn't quite as it seems. This Freudian slip can be seen in individuals all the time. And by the way, it's amazing, before Freud, this was something that wasn't really known or acknowledged. Now we kind of know 
movies, we kind of have an idea of it. But before that, um, it, it, the Freudian slip is the exact thing that we're trained to ignore. All sciences look at something. They, they, you know, physics looks at uh, you know, the, the structure of the universe, or mathematics looks at numbers, uh, chemistry, chemical systems, whatever, right? But the, the Freudian slip, the unconscious, is you look at the thing that's not something. It's the absence of something. So I have, a, I have a friend who went through a separation. He has a couple of kids. And uh, every Thursday night, he would go to his ex-partner's house, and he would tuck his kids in bed, read them a story, right? So one Thursday, he forgets. He's, uh, he's working late. He's stressed. Things are tough. And just completely forgets it. Um, and she doesn't say anything, you know, she just kind of lets it go. And then the next Thursday, he does the same thing again, right? And feels really, really guilty. And then this happens for a third week, right? And his ex-partner says to him, he's like, you know, what are you doing? Do you want your kids to hate you? You know, do you want them to grow up hating you and, and not wanting a relationship with you? What are you doing? And as he thought about it, uh, he briefly had this glimpse that actually maybe she's right. Maybe that's exactly what he's doing. Maybe he wants his kids to hate him. That there's so much self-loathing and guilt um, in his life from, the, from, when he's, from when he's been young. This is something he's carried with him. And in some strange sense, he hasn't been able to kind of address that. So somehow, he's putting this on his children to, 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 to actually concretize his own inner feelings. Now, why would that be the case? Well, because why would you forget your kids three weeks in a row? He doesn't forget meeting me, right? I, he doesn't love me the same way as he loves his kids at all. I'm a mate, but his kids. He doesn't forget meetings at work. Now, if he was forgetful in other ways, maybe there'd be another explanation. But the fact is, you know, he still goes to meetings on time, meets his friends on time, goes to the bar to see people, like doesn't forget that, but forgets his own kids. You go, suddenly that slip, that something, it tells you something. Or if every time you are going to visit your parents, you're always like looking for your keys. Like, no, no, you just do it once, that's fine, you're just looking for your keys. But every time you seem to lose your keys when you're going to see your parents, like, maybe <laughs> you do want to see your parents. Maybe there's something going on, like some, some unresolved issue that you haven't faced, but there's something in you, a little, a little mistake, something that's just, that just doesn't seem to fit in the picture. And that speaks the truth, a truth that you're not able to look at. Now, this is exactly what you see in detective uh, shows. The whole point of a detective show, like Columbo, of, of all time. Um, uh, but, you know, Columbo, there's lots of stuff in Columbo. I could do a whole talk in Columbo. Crazily, I could, and it's, uh, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, the, in Columbo, the criminal, uh, and it always shows you who did it and how they did it at the beginning, they, they, the criminal commits a crime, and then they, they create um, a scene in which everything looks a certain way, like that, not, that a crime didn't take place, that a murder didn't happen, that it was a suicide, or, or it was just like somebody had a heart attack, you know? And, and everybody, the police come in, and they see the story as the murderer presents it. But then Columbo comes in, and Columbo always works out who the first moment that he walks into the room, pretty much, he, he knows. It's amazing, he always knows. And then the rest of it is just him trying to kind of get it, you know, let the other person know that he knows and bring the evidence to the surface. But, you know, he looks around the room and, and he, sees, he sees a cigarette butt uh, in the ashtray. And he's like, okay, this, this cigarette butt, it's been squashed. You know, the person smoked it and squashed it. Oh, that's interesting. You know, the cigarettes in this guy's bedroom bin, they haven't been squashed. They just have been smoked to the end and then dropped in the bin. So this guy doesn't, this guy doesn't put out his cigarettes. This guy smokes them to the end and then puts them to one side. Something's not right. There was somebody else who's a smoker who was here, and then he notices the, per the person sitting who's always the guest star, so you know it was him, although he knew you anyway, but um, <laughs> uh, smoking and then and stubbing out the cigarette. And he's like, ah, 
There it is. There's the answer. So what nobody else sees, Sherlock Holmes is the same. Watson is the idiot. Watson is the person who sees what the murderer wants you to see. So um, philosopher Shizak talks about how you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes needs Watson because Sherlock Holmes needs to see what the idiots see. So he says, Watson, what do you see? And then he sees, and he goes, ah, that's what the criminal wants us to see, right? And then um, you know, Sherlock Holmes sees the one element quite fit. And this one little element is the error that speaks the truth. Um, we are all propaganda posters. This is the point I want to make it, uh, in this session, and I keep an eye on time. Um, I started at 10.30, is that right? Yeah, 10.10. And uh, I've got until... Okay, okay, right, lock the doors. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, we are all propaganda posters. We have an image of ourselves that we present to the world um, and to ourselves. Uh, you know, you, you can think of it in terms of Facebook because that's an easy example. In Facebook, you have um, an image of yourself, but it's like a, it's like a cleaned up image of yourself. And it's, it makes, you know, you, you, you say, oh, you know, I really like, uh, I love, I love, um, uh, Dostoevsky, you know, I love uh, Tolstoy. You don't talk about how you really love Fifty Shades of Grey, right? You, got, you know, you're painting a, a picture of, of of yourself, you know, pictures that make you look good, and you know, get rid of the ones where you, the double chin showing or whatever. <laughs> um, it's kind of like an idealized reflection of of your conscious self, but it's derivative because, in a sense, this is your Facebook profile. That what you, how you live day to day is a is a a kind of a cleaned up version of yourself. And that's completely normal and completely good. You, I wouldn't want to know all of your darkest, deepest secrets. Please don't tell me, I don't want to know. <laughs> um, but you know, there's lots of stuff that we don't even admit to ourselves that we're carrying with us. But in our daily lives, we, we put out an image. And, and, and that image, kind of, we fall for it. We think that that's the truth of who we are. But, and that's an element of who we are, but it's often a, a construct. Um, where you know, I have an image of myself as loving animals. This is great, I kind of do, I, but, I love, but then I'm also, I'm also a meat eater, and they do terrible things in the abattoirs, right? I don't want to know that because I love animals, right? The, my image of myself is I love animals. So you know, anything that kind of cuts against that, I have to try to avoid. So if I see animal rights people across the road or whatever, because I, I know what I'm going to see, and what I'm going to see is something awful, and then I'm going to have to either admit that I don't like animals, or at least I don't like some of them, right? Um, or, or I'm going to have to do something about my lifestyle. There's a story of a, a king who comes back to his castle, and he sees a beggar at the gates, and he says to the servants, get rid of this beggar, execute him, put him out of the city, do whatever you need to do. You know that I'm such a kind and compassionate man that I cannot bear to look upon such suffering. Right? You know, it's a, we, we have images of ourselves and, and th sometimes the, the stuff, the truth um, of who we are, we can't look at. Like, you know, it, the alcoholic is a, a good example. Is, you know, to be an alcoholic, often you... Will say I'm not an alcoholic. I can give up any time I want. I can, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's under control. And there comes a point when that false narrative, and you have to give it up. And in AA, you have to say, you know, my name is Pete, and I'm an alcoholic. You have to kind of like get the false narrative in line with what's going on, which is what a lot of you know therapy is about: getting the false narrative you tell yourself about yourself, and getting it to express something actually of your anxieties and fears and struggles. Um, or spiritual counseling, or journaling, you know, you kind of journal to try to, to get to a point where you're able to touch on some of, some of those issues. So in a sense, we can all be like the propaganda poster, and, and our truth comes out in the weirdest times. Last night I, I mentioned this, but you might be, have an outburst of anger, and you go, I don't know, I, always get, I have these outbursts of anger, I shout at the kids, I feel really bad about it, that's not really me. But actually that could be a symptom that speaks of something that you're not dealing with in your life. Or you burst into tears because you're watching the Budweiser advert or something. You're going, like, why am I crying about this? You know? you're, going, you're not crying about that. You know, you're, there, maybe there's something else you haven't mourned. And you push down and it comes out in this bizarre way. Um, so as individuals, 
we have this, and as individuals often we have to look at what are our symptoms, what are the little things that we kind of ignore that might tell us something that, that, that we need to look at. And that's very hard to do, and we often need to, our friends and people around us and, and professionals to kind of help look at those things, to find a three-finger gesture, because that's the truth of, of, of the Soviet Union at the time, is that the Soviet Union wants to say everything's clean, everything's great, but actually there's something wrong that's being hidden, something monstrous. And so the re- they were right, the censorship committee, to get rid of that poster in the sense of they're going like, you, people see that poster and they'll say, that's the truth. The truth isn't this, the truth is that, the hand. Stalin's hiding something because Stalin was known to have like an atrophied left hand. He always hid it in, in photographs, you know, underneath the coat, or behind whatever. So when people see it, it's, like, it's almost like, there, that's what he's hiding. It's hiding something monstrous. That's what the state's hiding. There's something monstrous going on. That's the truth that has to be repressed. And the more we try to have a clean image of ourselves as, as everything's great, everything's good, everything's fantastic, the more we have to push down the bad stuff because it doesn't fit. The more, I think I mentioned this last night, but many of you weren't there, is a relationship where you, you, you think that the other person will fulfill you, you make you whole, that, that if you get married, which is a, a fantasy that you, you see a lot, um, in, in the US actually, among young people in their 20s, like get married that somehow this will fulfill you. This is the finishing line, this will make you whole and complete. Well, as that begins to crack, you either, you, you generally have to push the stuff down. You don't talk about the, the bitterness, the anger, the frustrations, you push that down. And, and what's the symptom? Well, the symptom is often a, a, a couple who are always telling you how happy they are. Right? That's the symptom. You know, if a couple has a few photographs of them being happy on Facebook, that's great, they're happy. But if they're always putting up pictures of them being happy on Facebook and status updates about how, like, how great things are, going like, oh my goodness, things must be awful. Right? Because why else would they be constantly having to tell us how happy they are? Right? It's like, it was like the denial of the alcoholic. Denial is not when you say, I'm not an alcoholic. Denial is when you say, I'm not an alcoholic, when nobody asks you. Oh, listen, you know, this party, there's not enough drink. I'm just going to go down and buy, buy a little bit more. But, like, I'm not an alcoholic. Right? I'm like, oh, right, okay. Well, I never even asked if you were, right? So in that, in that relationship, it's like, wait, I didn't, we're not asking you if you're happy, but you seem to continually want to tell us you are. Now, they may be. That's only a hint. That person, they may genuinely be happy, but it can be a symptom. It can stand out and go, is there something being, being repressed and not talked about? Um, and, and so the more, the more you kind of try to hold it, everything's great. The more something goes down and it speaks. We don't speak it, it, it speaks. It finds ways to communicate. Um, I want to, not only as individuals, also communities have this. Our families have this. Um, you can have like, for example, uh, I've, I've, I've noticed this, where I've got a friend who every time her parents come around, she has to hide all the alcohol in the house, right? So she hides it all, and they come around, and I'm like, you know, do they not know you drink? And she's like, oh yes, they do. In fact, they were the ones who asked me to hide the alcohol. Like, okay, so you have to pretend that you don't drink, right? And pretend that the house is empty of alcohol. But they were the ones who told you to do it. So they know that you drink. I'm like, yeah, well, why? Oh my goodness, well, there'd be, a, there'd be an argument if, if there was some alcohol left out, because there was one time she, she forgot to put wine away. And, um, and, and it caused a massive argument, you know? Oh my goodness, the family would be in crisis if I kept the alcohol out. The family already is in crisis. It just doesn't know it. <laughs> just, or, you know, a lot that happens I've seen is uh, some children, your um, parents in a conservative home or whatever, when their, their, their son or daughter comes back to the house with their partner, they have to sleep in separate rooms if they're not married or whatever. But they know that they sleep together outside of the house. So it's not that they don't, they think naively that they don't, they know they do, but, but under the, the, the roof, everyone has to pretend that it doesn't happen. Now, it's different if it's said, that's how you do it, but if it's not said, it's just this unspoken thing. Or, or, or people I know who, every time they go back to their parents, they go to church. You don't go to church usually? No, 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 I just, when I'm, just when I'm home. They're like, do your parents think that you go to church when you're away? Oh no, they know I don't. Like, okay, again, so it's like having to play, play this kind of game. See, this is, this is how systems work. I mean, this is very, very key. Um, that ideological systems in families or in, in, in churches or whatever, there's ideologies tell you what's acceptable 
and tell you what's unacceptable, right? That's what they do. They say what's acceptable and what's unacceptable, but they also tell you the acceptable ways to do the unacceptable. And that's the key. All ideologies have the acceptable and the unacceptable, and then this set of disavowed, acceptably unacceptable practices that you can do um, in order to, to maintain what's going on. And, uh, you know, an example of that is, uh, you know, I, I, I say a church where it's very important, belief is central. You know, what's acceptable is to believe certain things. Believe in God, believe in Jesus, believe in these things, right? That's, that's very, very important. What's unacceptable in this community, this fictional community, but, but you know, we we'll all know communities like this, is doubting, questioning, um, you know, having periods of not believing that stuff, right? That's, that's kind of unacceptable. You find that if you're doing that, if you're an elder and you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead or something, you, you know, you'll be taken off the eldership team. You'll be removed. You might be able to attend, but you, you can't be a member or something like that. So that's unacceptable. But that's not the end of it. There's the acceptably unacceptable, which is you can actually have all those doubts, just don't ever talk about them, right? We all, you know, so I had this, I, we run a group called the Omega Course, or I have, and it's kind of like the Alpha Course in reverse, if you know, it's like exiting Christianity in 12 weeks, but like toxic religion in 12 weeks. And it's like the Alpha Course in that you still look at the same theological topics, but you look at a diversity of opinions throughout the Christian tradition. And, um, and you don't sum it up with the kind of right answer at the end. You have the discussion. But we were talking about uh, the resurrection. And there was a woman there who said, oh, you know, I don't know if I believe in a literal resurrection. And somebody else said they did. And somebody else said, you know, I've never actually thought about it. I mean, I say the words every week in church, but I've, just, I've never really critically engaged with that thing. It's just, you know, this is an interesting conversation for me. But at the end, what was interesting was the woman came up to me and, and she was like, she said, listen, I, I've believed in that all my life, you know, and, and, um, and I'm an elder in my church, and I'm on the worship team, I'm in the Fair Trade Cafe that's part of it, where we give money to charity. She says, you know, you know if, I, if I said this, I'd be taken off the eldership team, I'd be taken off the worship team. I'd still be able to do something unimportant, like work in the Fair Trade Cafe where all the money's given to charity, <laughs> but something important like strumming a guitar, I couldn't do that. But, um, but the... Uh, uh, you know, she said, but you know, so, and she says, I'm just at the point where I'm questioning that. I mean, she says, next week I might believe it again, or whatever. And she started, she was kind of, you could tell she was worked up about it, that she was self policing, that she was kind of policing herself about her own beliefs, fearful. And, and so, of course, my question is kind of, well, do you think you're the only one on the eldership team who has those questions and doubts? And she's like, well, I guess not. You know, they're thoughtful people, they're smart people, they're people who have been in this for years. I can't imagine they haven't had periods where they haven't questioned that. Maybe they all have, maybe they all do. I'm going like, yeah, there you go. The unacceptable is not having the doubts. The unacceptable is sharing them. You have to pretend that you don't. And, uh, and you see this within a lot of churches where we all know that the ministers don't believe half of what they say, right? And I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about the main line. We all know that they don't believe any of it. I'm talking about evangelicals, right? You know, um, and the mega churches. I know these people, right? You know, um, and everybody knows that, except for young Christians and true believers. Like there's, there's usually a small percentage in the church who, who, who don't know that. But most people do. They know, oh, they know, oh, you've got trouble in your relationships. Of course you've had doubts and you've had questions, right? There's no problems. That. Everyone knows that. Um, the thing is, it's like, but, but we're conspiring with you to never say it. Just never say it, right? If it's said, it becomes a really big problem, right? And the minister has to be got rid of. And, and if you don't believe me, I've seen it happen time and time again. And the funny thing is, people will get angry with the minister. Angry. Why are they angry? Why are they not surprised? If they didn't know that their minister had doubts, you'd think they'd be surprised. Oh my goodness, our minister has doubts. But if you're angry about it, it's like... That's different. Like if I say, I think your partner's having an affair and you're angry at me and you kick me out of the house and you say, I never want to see you again. It's like, oh, oh, you already know, right? Because <laughs> why would you not be surprised? Oh my goodness, seriously? Oh, I, I had no idea. Okay, that's different. But you're angry, you're frustrated, you want to punch me, you want to get rid of me, you want to kick me out. It's like, oh, you know, but you just don't want to know that you know, right? Um, and that, that's the unconscious, is, is the stuff that we know, but we don't want to know that we know. We don't want to be confronted with our disavowed knowledge. 
It's what uh, Shizek says about WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks was not about what we didn't know. That was boring, that's for gossip magazines. What one politician thought about another politician, no. This, the truly controversial stuff, with the stuff we all knew but didn't want to know that we knew. Black hole prisons, torture of innocents, uh, you know, ar arrest of, of people who are innocent, all that, we all knew that was going on. We didn't want to know that we knew it, right? <laughs> we want plausible deniability. When it's brought to the surface, we're like confronted with it, or Snowden with the, with, with, with the um, uh, surveillance stuff. We all know that. We just don't want to know that we know it. It's the problem. Um, the most dangerous knowledge is being confronted with the stuff that, that we already kind of, at some level, have some awareness of. So you have a system there where there's the acceptable, you know, oh, and by the way, here's the interesting thing. The acceptedly unacceptable transgressions are not something that you can just get rid of. They're an integral part of the system itself. Within, say, that church where you have to have belief you shouldn't have doubts, but actually you can, you can question yourself. The worst thing for that community is a person who doesn't have the, acceptable, the, uh, the acceptably unacceptable transgression. The true believer, who's, which is kind of like a, a more psychotic person who, who has full belief, they're a total problem. If you let them get to the top, it's going to go be a nightmare, right? It's all going to collapse. They're not going to lock the doors at night because God will take care of it. They're not going to put a, a lightning rod in the steeple because it's all going to be fine. You know, you get, no, you gotta, we're, we say that, but we don't believe it. Right, you know, and, and, and so you got, there's actually this really weird thing where, where the naive believer has to be slowly integrated into the acceptable transgressions, but it can never be said. If you've seen the film Training Day, it's a great film to watch, um, it, it kind of captures this. Uh, in Training Day, there's this veteran cop, hardened narcotics guy, right, uh, who's played by Denzel Washington. And there's this rookie. Rookie is a naive believer, right? Say, imagine it's a church. Denzel Washington is the, the, he's been in the church for a long time, and there's the rookie who's completely new to it. And what, what basically happens is everything's corrupt. Denzel Washington's corrupt, the, the whole the, uh, police system's corrupt. Uh, he, the rookie thinks, hey, we're here to arrest people who are in the drugs, you know, try and keep the streets clean, try and do good. But what he finds out very slowly is that actually there's a whole pile of stuff going on, money being stolen, etc. And this rookie has to be integrated into the acceptable transgression, but it can't be said. They don't ever say it directly. It can never be spoken. It has to re be, remain unspoken. And if he can't be integrated into it, he has to be killed, right? Um, again, uh, Shizek, who's a philosopher who I think is deeply insightful in these issues, he uses the example of like 1950 town America, where during the day everything's you know, law-abiding, white picket fences, it's great. But then at night, the KKK are out doing their thing, right? And actually, the police, some of the people who are in the police during the day are in the KKK at night. And if you're in that town, you have to, in a sense, you don't speak it, you don't ever say it. Because if you say it, if you bring that to the surface, uh, if you're black, you'll be killed. If you're white, you'll be uh, shunned. You have to kind of implicitly accept the acceptable transgression. You have to kind of conspire with it in some, in some secret way, right? That's the, that's the acceptably unacceptable transgression. Um, political systems have it. There's, a, there's a two comedians called Mitchell and Webb from the UK, and they're very good. I'd really recommend you watch them. Um, and they've got very insightful sketches. But they had a sketch uh, a couple of years ago that captures this in a really interesting way. The setup is like a James Bond super villain hideaway, right? There's this blue felt type character who is like, you know, the cat, the, the, the suit, and in this office with a world map, and, you know, it's just got this, you know, super villain feel. And he's sitting in the office, and then two henchmen come in, dressed all in black with like polo necks, and this conversation ensues. I'm afraid, sir, we still have a problem with Detective Harrison. Yes, Mr. Harrison has an irritating talent of disrupting my arrangements. Would you like me to have him removed? Yes, perhaps. Perhaps it would be better if Detective Harrison were taken out of the picture. So at this point, the second henchman speaks. Sorry, guys, you're doing it again. 
What, Alan? Have him removed, taken out of the picture. I thought we agreed at the meeting that these terms are needlessly ambiguous. We all agreed that from now on, when we want someone murdered, i.e. deliberately killed to death, that's what we're going to say. <laughs> Look, everyone knows what he means. Yes, on this instance, perhaps, I mean, that was an order to murder Detective Harrison, right? <laughs> Detective Harrison has become a nuisance. Yes, but a nuisance we should murder. I mean, my nephew's a nuisance, right? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Well, can you say it, please? Okay. Please deal with the Harrison situation. Oh, you see, that's no good. Oh, that was perfectly clear. <laughs> What are you talking about, Keith? This is going to be let's hope Professor Ritson meets with a little accident all over again. We waited nine months for Professor Ritson to meet with a little accident until Leslie told us it was an accident we were supposed to make happen. Right? Um, now, what's, what's brilliant, I think, about this sketch is they can't say it. They cannot say the thing. They can't say it. It's like everybody knows what's being said, but still, there has to be plausible deniability. And in, in, in governments, you see it. It's like, you can't say torture. You can't say it. You can't say it. You have to say enhanced interrogation, right? You can't say whenever you see things going on in Israel and Palestine. You can't, you can't call it what it is. You have to find these ways, these strange... And we, but we all know what it means. We all know what enhanced interrogation means. But it cannot be said. It has to, be, it has to re remain unspoken. This is called the big other in psychoanalysis. Is this, this something that we're all conspiring to keep in the dark. It's like if you go to a nightclub and at two o'clock in the morning, everybody's having fun, everybody's drinking, everybody's having a laugh. It's like, it's, you know, but yet actually the symptom is like, I don't think they are. You know, there's somebody nervously on their phone or holding their beer. And you start to wonder, now I'm not talking about 10 o'clock at night, I'm talking about two in the morning. If you turned on the lights and turned down the music and had everyone look at each other just for five minutes, we'd all be in tears, crying, <laughs> weeping. You know? It's like, who are we trying to fool? We all know none of us are happy, right? But there's, there's some dupe up there, the god of hedonism, we can't let them know. It's um, the emperor doesn't know that we're naked. I mean, don't, don't tell the emperor. Um, this is the big other. This is, and funnily enough, um, there's an interpretation of uh, God saying, you shall have no other gods before me. Um, as as a, a literally, taking it literally, you shall have no other gods before me. You can have gods, just don't do it in front of me, right? Yeah, you know, it's like, it's like the father who says, you can't get drunk in this house. You know, nod and a wink. You can go get drunk with your friends, but don't do it discreetly. Don't do it in front of us. The ideologies always have a, you know, you can do something discreetly, nod and the wink can't be said, but you have to be integrated into it in order to fully erase. That's the problem with saying hypocrisy and conservatism is like a, is like a problem. That, it's not just a problem that can be got rid of, it's actually often implicated in the very system itself. It's part of how the system runs, so you can't kind of deal with it um, without actually restructuring the entire system. Now, um, I don't want to go much further in this session, but I do want to try and draw this to some sort of interesting conclusion, if I can, um, is that, it, so what I'm saying is, let, let's take an example again of, of, of a church, a church where belief is very, very important. So back to that example, and you're looking at it, and everything seems good, belief is important, it's solid, where's the symptom? Well, in this example I'm using, let's imagine a church where they, somehow, a book comes out, love wins, right, for example, or whatever. And they go ballistic. Yeah, I mean, they start to, to preach against this book. They, they uh, if anybody's reading it, they get ostracized. You know, it's like, you shouldn't read this book. This is terrible, whatever, right? Now, that's weird. Because it wouldn't be weird if they said, we don't like it, right? What did the Amish do when loved ones come out? They don't agree with it. They don't care, they're just building barns. They don't care, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, whatever, you know? So you're going like, so why the extreme reaction? Why not just even, why not just even a, a reaction of, well, we don't, we don't agree with this? Why, not? why an extreme reaction? You go, that just doesn't, that doesn't seem quite right. What's going on? So that's the symptom, right? And so you go, okay, what does the symptom reveal? What does the symptom speak? And then you go in this example, okay, well, maybe actually the questions that are being asked in this book that's come out are questions that actually exist within that community. 
but they haven't been able to be brought to the surface. So, so, there, so the anger that's being expressed at someone who's reading that book or, or, or this or that is actually, um, uh, uh, what that actually speaks of is a crisis within that community that those questions exist, but they're not being able to be brought to the light of day. Now, what we often do, and this is key, is we think that the symptom is the problem, right? The, the expression of anger, the outburst of anger, that's the problem. We have to try and, try and fix that. Um, and so if a community, there's too much of that, they kind of maybe try and address that. The symptom isn't the problem. The symptom is the solution to a problem, right? The solution is a solution to a problem within that community. They're not able to look at the doubt the complexity, the ambiguity, they're not, allowed to bring, they're not able to bring that stuff to the surface. They're not able to look at, at if that took place. So the symptom is the result. The symptom is the cure. It allows them to continue business as usual. Um, and as long as we try to fix the symptom, rather than what the symptom speaks, we don't really get very far. Now this has long range consequences for anything. Think of it in terms of homelessness. We think homelessness is a problem, right? But in a sense, it's not. It's the solution to a problem. There's a, a, of a society. It's a societal solution to a problem. Pollution, maybe it's underemployment. Maybe it's inability to look after people with uh, mental health issues. Maybe it's uh, any number of issues, problems in families or whatever. But there's a problem in the society. And the solution is a homeless population. Bam, it erupts. And if you go to, to the homeless and you go, right, we want to fix that and help the homeless, which is a very good thing to do, right? But if you're just doing that, um, there'll always be more homeless people to help. You'll ne you know, it'll, it'll never go away. It'll always continue to be there. What one has to do is go, what is this the solution to? What is the problem with inside? You, you fix the problem and you get rid of the solution. So in that community, that church that I'm talking about, if you're able to get them to look at the doubts and the questions that are in that community, bring them to the surface, the outburst of anger dissipates, right? You get rid of it. Um, I, I knew of a person who, um, a therapist, who was working with a kid who was bedwetting. And they were bedwetting like, you know, I don't know what age that stops, but they were older than they should be for that. And they were, they were trying to work with this kid to work out what's going on. And, and gradually, the therapist was like, you know, I think this is the, there's something, a problem with the parents, right? And he finds out the parents are just in a very, very um, unhappy relationship and they're fighting all the time. And, but it hasn't been talked about. It's there, it's tr they're trying to hide it from the kid. But the kid knows. And, and so they bring the parents in, and as they talk about the conflicts and all of that, and as they bring that to the surface, the bedwetting stops, right? The bedwetting wasn't the problem, it was the solution to a problem. And you get rid of the problem, and you get rid of the solution. In the same way of alcoholism, in a sense, alcoholism is not a problem, it's the solution to a problem. Um, that becomes itself problematized. But if you, if you, know, you all know this, you'll all know someone who maybe has an addiction to something, and if they, if they fix it, but they haven't worked out why it happens. They just become addicted to something else. Drinking Diet Coke obsessively, smoking obsessively, keep fit obsessively, religion obsessively, whatever it is. They, they, if they haven't dealt with the issue, they find another, another uh, something else stands in for the symptom. And maybe it's a slightly better symptom, like it's like less damaging to them, but it still hasn't, hasn't touched the core, hasn't got to the issue. So, all of this to say, and what's this to do with Christianity? <laughs> um, you can see the prophets and Jesus and, 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 and Luther and, as simply bringing to light the unspoken of the systems that exist. You know, like, so Luther, for example, was just, all he, he didn't want to create a new church. He just wanted to bring up the stuff that everybody knew about, you know, the, the indulgences made the wars and the powerful and the like. He wanted to bring that to the surface, bring it to the surface. Um, you know, Jesus talked about whitewashed tombs. You know, on the outside you're all clean, but there's rotting bones on the inside. Wanted to shine light on the inside. The dirty cup, it's clean on the outside, but it's dirty on the inside. So there's this strange sense in which the prophet is often the ones speaking the truth that we all know, but we do want to know that we know. Bringing up the disavowed stuff. Bringing it to the light of day. And when you do that, 
The system cannot continue as it is. And Ferguson is another example politically where, you know, the, the unspoken is maybe is racism and violence and this stuff that's unspoken, but everyone knows it's there. It's part of everyday life. It's integrated into the system. But every now and again, the symptom explodes. There's a violence and the symptom speaks the truth. This little thing, go like, that was just a one-off thing. And that speaks the truth of something. And so what the protesters attempt to do is keep the truth on the surface, bring it up so that you can see it. If you have a family, right, mother and a father and kids, and the acceptable is love and you care for each other, you look out for each other. The unacceptable is, you know, uh, having affairs and, 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 and overworking and all of this. But the acceptable, the unacceptable is you can do that stuff, just don't ever talk about it, right? And there's lots of relationships that work like this. You know, just be discreet. You know, have no other gods before me. You know, do, you know, have no other, you know, don't, don't do that stuff in front of me. I don't want to see your mobile phone. I don't want to know what you're doing on the computer, right? And, and everything continues to function normally. You can have bitterness, just don't let ever talk about it. But strangely, everybody knows it. The unspoken is what we all, the kids and the parents, we all are conspiring in without ever directly speaking. And so the relationship can continue for years, 20, 30 years like that. You're, and you go, why? why? Why not bring up the stuff? Well, because it, the relationship would be in crisis if it did. No, the relationship is in crisis. And you bring that stuff to the surface, one of two things are going to happen. Either the, they're gonna, people are going to split up, they're going to go, you know what, this is, you know, we can't work together, we're going to break up. Or they'll go, you know what, we have to find a new way of relating. We need to do the difficult work of trying to see if we can rekindle something. But it can't stay the same. That's the one thing that it can't do. It can't stay the same. Something new erupts. Whenever Luther was bringing up the truth of the time, the system had to change. Something had to happen. Something had to erupt. They try to kill the people who bring the truth up to the surface. If they can't do that, the system has to, has to change. And then something new often arises. Pro the, press, the Protestant church grows up. But then that itself then has repressed. And then people have to come and bring the repressed of that to the surface. And this kind of, this process is ongoing, is, is speaking and bringing to the surface what is unsaid. What is unsaid. So in this first session, all I want to do is, is lay the groundwork for saying that perhaps a healthy community, politically, individually, family communities, a community like this, is where we can find ways of looking at the unspoken things that we all uh, conspire with. Bringing that to the surface in the sense that that is actually going to be transformative. That is going to give rise to healthier spaces, to new forms of religious life. Um, and, and it can look different in different settings. And in some, for some of us in religion, it's about doubt and complexity, ambiguity. And for many of us, I think that's where my message began. It was like, you know, it's, it's not like I was on a radio station where a guy had written 10 books on apologetics and he had a radio station where three days a week he talked about apologetics, right? This guy knew as Josh McDowell, tell you that. Uh, he knew as evidence that the man's a verdict. And I didn't know at the time, I didn't know what I was going to be on. I was talking to him and he was said to me at one point, he said, Peter, that, you know, I should doubt. I should ask questions about my faith. I should not. And I'm like, no, of course I'm not saying that. I'm saying you're already full of doubt. I mean, why else would you have written 10 books in apologetics, right? <laughs> why else would you have a show three days a week <laughs> about apologetics if you weren't riven with questions and doubts? Because, you know, like that's a bit obsessive, really. Like, if, you know, if, if you're confident in what you believe, you, you, know, you might write a book on it, I don't know, but it's like, whoa, I'm not your psychoanalyst, but it looks like something's going on, right? Um, the point is, for me, like, in some communities, that's, that's the unspoken. Because it's not, that, it's not that you believe, it's that you kind of, in a sense, um, disavow your, your doubts and your questions. You, you play the game because if you start to crack that open, it's hiding something. I don't know what it's hiding. It might be hiding anxiety, um, unknowing death, all, all these things that it hides. And that's fine if it worked, but, but that's the problem. The problem is that the symptom means it doesn't work. It comes out in violence and people who disagree with you. You know, it comes out in violence against yourself, the parts of yourself that you disagree with. It comes out in unhealthy ways. 
And so, so for me, you know, in that setting, it's, it's bringing that to the surface. But it's different within progressive circles. In progressive circles, belief isn't the thing that you hold to. Um, you know, you can go like, I don't know if God exists. Oh, that's fine. I don't know if Jesus is just a guy. He was just a guy. Yeah, it's fine. You know, devil, devil's great. Yeah, that's fine. Don't worry about it. We're thinking of moving the altar five feet to the right over my dead body, right? <laughs> you know, um, the, uh, the, 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 the structure, the liturgical system, um, seems to act symptomatically. It's, it's protecting the community from some sort of anxiety and brokenness. And the key is, is how do we, in an indirect way, and this will be for the next sessions, indirectly be able to confront people with these truths? One final example. Uh, the old woman at the back of the church, you know, stereotypical example of who, who doesn't want the carpets to ever be changed. You go like, oh my goodness, we want to change the carpets. Those carpets are going to stay the same. You know, those carpets were there when my father was there and my father's father was there. Those carpets are staying. You're like, why is she always talking about the carpets? What's her issue with the carpets? Well, it's not about the carpets. It's not about the carpets. It's about how she, her kids don't visit her. Um, it's about how she lost her husband. Um, it's about how she feels very, very lonely. And she doesn't have people she can talk to. It's not about the carpets. If we think it's about the carpets, we're idiots. It's not about the carpets. It's about something else. And if you direct and keep on trying to work out the carpets, you're not going to help that person. This is going to be a real problem. That's the symptom that speaks of anxieties and fears. And, and so what you do whenever that person says, you know, I, those carpets aren't changing, you go, yeah, here, tell me about your husband. You know, tell me about your life. You know, tell, me, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your kids. And, and you talk about it, you open up, and, it, and, if, and if those are the issues that are being repressed, as you talk about them, you don't have to talk about the carpets. Be like, yeah, you know, we need to, we need to move on, we need to, we need to change things. I, I, need to, I need to move on in my life, and I need to realize that, you know, my husband's not coming back, you know, and, and you know what, we've got to change things, and yeah, the carpets are thread, threadbare, I can see your point, let's change them, right? That's... If I go round to your house and you, I see you and your partner arguing about leaving the lights on before, when you go to bed, if you, if you have a little argument about that, it's about leaving the lights on before you go to bed. If you're about to tear each other's heads off over it, it's not about turning off the lights before you go to bed. It's about something else. And you've got to work that through. Um, and, and so within our religious communities, instead of... Instead of kind of trying to create uh, the image of the propaganda poster, you know, like everything's good, everything's great, which pushes down and represses. It's, I think the role of the leader and the role of the music and the, the prayers and the sermons is about trying to isolate the symptom in the community. What is it we're not looking at? And indirectly through the liturgical system itself, bring those to the surface. Let us look at the things that we'd rather not look at and we'll, we'll find it's transformative. And that means it's not primarily about the right belief, right? It's not about the right belief. There's a saying I heard someone, um, a comedian, I uh, can't remember who, say back in Europe, said, Americans, you've got to love them, otherwise they'll bomb you, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, the funny thing is, you can, you know, somebody could say, you know, I love God and God loves me. And, and, I, and, and they would affirm everything that, say, a church would affirm. Uh, if you stop there and don't ask them why they love God, um, you might not discover that actually when they were young, they were told that if they didn't love God, God would punish them. Or if they didn't love God, uh, their parents would, would give them away or something. Or, or they felt somewhere very deep down that if they didn't affirm that belief, something terrible would happen. But th that belief is repressed, so they've forgotten about the whole reason why they have it. But it comes out in unhealthy ways, and you can notice it. So it's, like, it's not like if, if I see someone who says, I think God hates me, I'll ask why. I don't say, yes, no, God loves you. There's no point. It's that, it's just, th th that resonates with you, God hates you. I want to go, why, why do you think that? And, and I find that you know, maybe you feel really guilty about something, we talk that through. But if you say, I love God, I have to go, why? Because... You know, it's like in a kid in therapy, you say, do you love daddy? Kids say, I love daddy. I think daddy's great. Daddy's fantastic. And you go, well, does Teddy like daddy? Oh, no, Teddy hates daddy. Daddy, daddy, thinks, he, daddy thinks daddy's an idiot, right? You know, like, 
the kid doesn't need the therapy. It's the teddy bear that needs the therapy, right? The kid's fine. But the, the teddy bear is the symptom, the symptom speaking. The kid has repressed because the kid needs to live in the family. So has repressed that. It says, oh, I love daddy and, and convinced him that he loves daddy. But, but the symptom speaks, going like, no, there's, so, there's something there. And the idea then is not to get the right belief out of the community, but to really start to delve into the kind of the unspoken, those dark places. We shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. Okay, um, Ben, how are we doing time-wise? Have we got time for questions? Should we break for coffee and then have questions? What are you thinking? Um, let's do like uh, maybe like 10 or 15 minutes of, of Q&A, and then we'll get ready to break for lunch. Brilliant, yeah, so just like 10 minutes. So you, and you can grab a coffee if you need to, run away if you need to. You're not trapped, I promise. <laughs> but um, anybody want to ask some questions or some thoughts on what I've shared? So you find yourself in one of these places that is trying to stabilize itself by dealing with the symptom rather than the problem. Yeah. Uh, whether it be a church or a university or a community. Um, it seems like one solution is just to go with the flow. The other solution is to just jettison and exit. How uh, do you have any advice for those uh, who perhaps are in the middle of it trying to change from the inside? Oh yeah, absolutely. And in one sense, actually, I'm going to try and address that well because that's you're you're asking exactly the right question. Like, okay, this this is interesting theory, the symptom problem. Hopefully, that is intellectually interesting to you. But the real interest is, well, how do we do this? Can you repeat the question? And then, if people do have questions come up, because there are people watching online and they can't. Oh yes. Can't hear the question, so, so I think. Can you repeat his question, and then if you're coming for another one, just come up to the mic. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, so I think the question was basically, well, how, how do you do this? If you're in a community that is, uh, you know, has these symptoms and isn't really looking beneath to, to, kind of the, to what's really going on, not really listening to what the symptom is saying, just trying to get rid of the symptom, uh, what do you do? You know, do you jettison? Do you, do you run off? Do you, do you work from within? And, and how do you work from within without getting fired? Without, you know, with that, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, that's important. And, and a very key... You know, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, that obviously resonates with some people. Is it? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's true. I've seen so many people get fired. I mean, I, I, one of my pieces of advice to people that I often say is, you know, work on this, but have an exit strategy, right? You know, because you know, if you'll get if you get three years out of it, you're doing good. Jesus got three years out of it. You know, so if you got three years, that's good. But have an exit strategy just in case. And um, that's a very practical piece of advice. But one thing I didn't say, and you've inspired me to mention this is that we've got to understand that, you know, there's a psychoanalytic joke, which is uh, how many psychoanalysts does it take to change a light bulb, right? And the answer is only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, psychoanalyst Bruce Fink, who he, you should really read, he's a great writer, but, you know, he says, well, that's the problem is in psychoanalysis, the light bulb doesn't want to change. That's the issue. The issue is we think that, you, you know, you, ha you have to really want to change, but we don't. What we want to do is the symptom gets too bad. There's something about us that stops us from working or we break up with someone and we're like, oh, right, there's something. I've got, I'm too angry. I want to get that fixed, right? But then when we realize that, oh, that doesn't just mean like making a small change. That means looking at my, my traumas and my fears and my anxieties. That's the point where you go, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I want, I want to be fixed a little bit. I want to deal with the symptom. I do want to go into all of that stuff. My goodness, no. And that's the point when a lot of people get out of therapy. It's the very point when they realize that, oh, I'm going to have to do that deep work. So it's very hard because you're in a community. And you have to be, you have to be aware that you, this is us. I do want to change. You know, and that's very key. You can't help other people unless you know yourself how you don't like to change. How if, if you challenge me about something, I'm going to say, Stop being an asshole, don't tell me that. You know, I'm, I'm an okay person, right? If you directly get at me. Um, so we all, like, you know, we're all uh, do want to change in some respects. So how do you work within a community um, where, where you can get down to the deep stuff when if you directly hit it, it's not going to work. So I see you treating your mum in a certain way. I go, look how you're treating your mum. That's awful. And you're like, oh, you don't know what she's like. She's a nightmare. She's mustard, you know? I live with her. 
you know, she's completely, she's mental, right? But, but then if I bring you out for a drink and say, oh, you seem a bit stressed, what's going on? You're more likely to go, yeah, I am, and you know what, I really took it out of my mum, right? Even if you know I'm right, if I directly go at you, you're going to defend yourself, even if deep down you know, yeah, I was bad. It's just as natural as defense mechanisms. Um, indirect communication is what we have to learn. Uh, parables, storytelling, comedy, singer, songwriters. These are, these are the tools of indirect communication that get around our defense mechanisms and, and are able to make things work. But I, I, I won't answer your question now because we're going to do a whole session on that, but, but that's where we're going is how do we actually do this? Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. You have to come up here. I forgot. So, uh, yeah. Um. So in my mind, I see a spectrum where on one hand is the church where Rob Bell's book came out. And I was actually doing an internship at a church when Rob Bell's book came out. And it was exactly like you described. The book is not going to be approved for small groups. Anybody who reads it, uh, we have to have a conversation. Yeah. But then I found myself moving in the other direction. The other direction to me is not, I don't believe in God. Rob Bell isn't foolish because he's wrong. He's foolish because he believes in that stuff. The other end of the spectrum is I don't believe in anything. Mm. And the... Uh, over here, you have the fundamental belief and belief, and over here, you have the fundamental belief and unbelief. Yep. How do you define that happy medium where you're holding both of those things in tension, and you say, you know, there's a part of me, like the guy who says in the Bible that I, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So you're kind of a foot in both worlds. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely, no, and it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, the funny thing is about the Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I have a, a certain reading of, of unbelief that, I'm going to try and say in five minutes because otherwise Ben's going to kill me. And you're going to kill me because we want to eat and drink and be merry. Um, uh, for tomorrow we die. That's a really interesting statement, you know. That's, it's, you both enjoy life by remembering you're going to die. That's the wonderful, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the, the money there. That's very difficult for us to do is how do we enjoy life in the midst of knowing Death and darkness, not in the escape from it. That's what grace can be in some respects, is the moment of silence before you eat is a kind of a way of not making the food unpalatable by saying, like, other people don't have it. It's, but it's about remembering that other people don't have it. So while you're enjoying it, you're also realizing that, you know, you're somehow you're embracing the darkness while you're eating something that's wonderful. Anyway. Um, oh, yeah. Um, my main interest... Um, with, un with unbelief and why I think the Bible has a problem with unbelief is, is, is not because it's the opposite of belief. It's, I think it's because it's actually what belief requires in order to function. And, and by that I mean um, church where you say, if you have enough faith and don't doubt, uh, you know, you'll see healing. Um, the, there's an unbelief in that in the sense of like you go like, unless it's your kid and then you call an ambulance. Right? But that's not said. That's just, you know, you, just, you have to know that. Yes, it's a wink and a nod, right? You know, um, the, the, the problem within it says that is, is not the liberal who says you believe too much. No, the, the, is the, the problem is you don't believe enough, right? The person in the church, he actually just fully believes that without a little bit of unbelief and, pray, and doesn't call an ambulance when their kid's sick and their kid dies. That's more of a problem for the system. That's like full belief. Um, there's a story from, uh, that I remember, Paddy Englishman, Paddy Irishman, Paddy Scotsman. I don't know if you have these jokes in America, but we have these always Irish, English, and Scottish, and the Irish are always the butt of the joke, even in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> but there's this one where they're all training to be in the SAS, and it's the last test, and they're brought up to a shack in the woods, and, and uh, the, the, the first guy goes in, the English guy, and the sergeant says, here's a gun. I want you to go into that room and shoot whoever's in there. The guy picks up the gun, goes in, and he comes back out, and he's like, he says, you got my brother in there. I can't, I'm not going to shoot my brother. I don't care. And he just throws the revolver on the table. Next is the Scottish guy. Comes in. Sergeant says, pick up that gun. I want you to shoot whoever's in that room. Kill whoever's in that room. Scottish guy goes in. He's in there for about 10 minutes. He comes out. He's sweating. He's nervous. But he's like, he's also smiling. He says, listen, you know, I know you're not going to get me to shoot my brother. Like, you know. But yeah, the gun was blanks. Full of blanks. I pulled the trigger. Right. Puts it down. Then it's the Irish guy. Irish guy goes in, sergeant says, here's a revolver, go into that room, kill whoever's in there. He goes in, he's in there for about five minutes, and then you hear like this scream and smashing of glass, and he comes out sweating. He said, some idiot put blanks in the gun. I had to bludgeon him to death, right? <laughs> um, um, <laughs> that you, but, yeah. 
But people think, people think that the Irish guy is the fundamentalist, right? He's the one who really believes what's being said, right? But no, it's the, it's the Scottish guy who's kind of the fundamentalist in a sense of it's the Scottish guy who, who fully believes but with the nod and the wink. Okay, you're not supposed to really believe. You know, there's, there's the acceptable transgression going on. And um, in some respects, what, what, the way I read it is that the people who fully accept their belief as in, and some of you will have been these people, or are these people, and this, this is what I was. I was a naive believer who whenever the church said certain things, I just believed them. I remember, this is no word of a lie, I was in church, and this guy gave a sermon about healing. He was a doctor medical doctor gave a certain thing about healing. The guy stood up beside me at the end of the service, tripped and broke his hand, broke his arm, right? Like this happened in the service. So of course me as the full believer, just take him to one side and start praying for him. Guy's like, there's like an agony and I'm just like, no, it's fine, it's fine, 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 fine. And eventually somebody gets the guy who did the talk, right? The guy, the doctor, he gave the talk about God's healing. He comes down, takes one look at the arm and says, call the ambulance, right? He's the one who didn't believe it, right? I was like, um, I was out every Saturday night doing kind of exorcisms and all of this. So I was like the full believer. But the interesting thing is, you know, how many of you destroyed your record collections? You know, I'm sure there's a few of you. Uh, the, 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 the interest is actually the full believer who often um, enters, who it collapses for. You go all the way and it internally collapses and it opens up into a different form of faith, which I think, and I can't really argue right now, I might come into it more, but gets you beyond uh, belief and unbelief and doubt and non-doubt. It enters into what I call the realm of faith. I, call, I, term, this, uh, I term it faith. I made up this word. No, <laughs> I think it is term is faith. And for me, no, but faith is a different modality of life that is not about, you know, we often think of faith as, as having a belief in something without evidence. But I would argue that faith is a mode of living. It's like if you love, if you believe the world is you love, you cannot help but experience the world is meaningful, even if you don't believe it is. And if you don't love, even if you believe the world is meaningful, you can't help but experience it as meaningless, even if you believe it's meaningful, right? Um, that's what faith is for me. Is faith is a mode of living in the depth and density of existence, regardless of what you believe or don't believe or doubt or question, quite Jewish in a way. The Jewish mother doesn't say to, to, the, to the woman who's marrying her son, uh, do you believe in God? No, that's like, oh, you sometimes do, you sometimes don't. Do you keep a kosher home? Are you part of the tradition? Are you in, 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 immersed in it? So all of this to say, um, the person who fully embraces their belief, you know, like, it, it, sorry, um, in a church... Why is that? Is that me? Do I, do I hit that? Yeah. Um, um, the, yeah. I think this is Ben just trying to tell me to stop. Um, the, in a church, right, uh, you often, are, when you start, you're at the edges, but you think, oh my goodness, if I could get to the center, that would be great. If I could get to the heart of that, if I could do all the things right, do all the fasting right, do all the get to the center. You know, those leaders, they're having cappuccinos with Jesus in there. You know, they're like, you know, when they go into that, that meeting room in the back and they close the doors, the heavens open, the angels sing, and it's like amazing, right? Now, as long as you don't ever get to the center, you, you maintain that strange fantasy. The people who get to the center realize the center doesn't hold. The media, it's, it's the most cynical place of all sometimes because there's nowhere else to go. You've done it all. I did it all. I, I destroyed my record collection. I did all the fasting. I did everything. I did it all. You know, bring it on. And, 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 it's, and you know what? I still have my doubts and anxieties and fears and it's, it's not great. Now, one of two things happen. Either by that stage, you're, now your job's in it, your pension, you've got family, so they've got you. So that's why sometimes the center's the most depressing place. You know, it's not, it's, not that the, it's not that the pastor really believes and the congregation don't. It's often the young congregation really believe and the pastor's like, I don't believe half of this, but I'm stuck, you know. Um, or you leave and, 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 oh, and or you metamorphosize into a different type of Christian community. That's why I'm, I'm very interested in, in working with conservative groups because I think, I mean, I hate to say it, but I actually think that conser young conservatives who really push and do everything and push and push and push, they can often be the, the mechanism that unfolds a different form of church. 
Uh, whereas the ones who kind of are kind of have a bit of unbelief and kind of hang back and do it, they end up being 40 or 50 years in a church that says all this kind of stuff and nobody really believes it. It keeps going every now and again, the symptom manifests in anger, aggression over whatever it is. Um, but actually what I'm interested in is, is a, different form, a different form of church of which I think collective is trying to be, be that. Um, now, I guess we should break. No. Or is there one more question? And I promise I'll be like 30 seconds or less. Well, come on up. Right. Better be good because this is the last one before we break. So. It won't be. Okay. <laughs> um, so as we try to psychoanalyze ourselves, and we recognize the things that make us angry, like when racism makes us angry or when women are being oppressed, that makes us angry, or when people due to their addiction to certainty, oppress others, it makes us angry. Is that j just the fact that I'm really a racist and I hate women? And like, I, like, uh, ho like how do I recognize? In your example, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking generally, I'm just talking about you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, like how, how do we listen to the ways that we're angry and yes. really um, engage for real change and transformation instead of just assuming it's all of the people that are doing things wrong and we're righteously angry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and in practice, this is, this is difficult. So it's easy to use examples and it's important to use examples, but uh, when it comes to individual communities and individual people, you have to treat them as a singularity. This is actually one of the reasons why they say psychoanalysis isn't a science. In the sense of a science is something that you replicate or general, but when you come to a psychoanalysis, you have to treat the individual as an individual. They are an individual universe in themselves, and so you have to work this stuff out. But there's, but there's little hints, and this is what, what I'm trying to train and myself to do and other people, is what are the things to look out for? And so what, what is the difference between, say, I think what you're asking is someone who is angry at something because um, they, it's an injustice, and someone who's angry with something because it's actually something a part of themselves. And, you know, it can look very, very similar. Um, some, I mean, an example of uh, one is that like you could see a pastor who's always shouting and screaming about kind of the secular world and all the things that they're doing out there. But they're, they're always so, they're always talking about it in such a way that you're kind of, it almost looks like they're jealous. Look at all the fun they're having, you know. They're talking about, oh, like there it's all sexually promiscuous and they're doing sex before breakfast and it's all terrible out there. And they're, and they're so sweating it out. It's like, it's like oh, you know, I, I won't be out there. But, but, but so you kind of get this sense of like a, actually a jealousy of the, you know, the secular world. Um, whereas, you know, the, the true uh, kind of the true fundamentals in that sense, the, like the, you know, Buddhist, like who just fully believes or an Amish person who believes, they're not jealous of, of, of secular society. They just feel a little bit like, you know, embarrassed for it. It's like, yeah, you think that brings happiness? No, yeah, forget it. You know, if you're really caught up, there's something there. But yeah, in terms of, you know, like I know someone, I know people who, or get really, really angry at uh, drunk driving, right? And the funny thing is, one person I know who gets like, just really angry about, like really angry within themselves, not angry, really angry with themselves, actually has done it a couple of times. And, and so what was really interesting is going like, it's a legitimate thing to be an angry about and it's a dangerous thing to do. But, so, so that was a good thing, but there was also something that was unresolved in him. I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I, let me see if this works. If it doesn't, we'll have to just delete it from the, the YouTube. This, part, this is all going up live. It's terrible. Um, it's, it's hard to know a defense mechanism when it's righteous anger. Whenever you are angry about something that's good to be angry about, it can still, it can still mean you're, you're, not, you're dealing with something within yourself. It doesn't, it, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, if, if I embrace philosophy, um, I, you, know, uh, you know, I want something that gives me meaning in my life and I don't want to look at my suffering, I, my emotional life, so I, I go throw myself into philosophy. Philosophy is a great thing. So you go like, that's a great thing, you know, that's fantastic. But still I have to ask myself, even though that's a good thing, is there something in me that that's covering over? to do whenever whenever you give yourself to a social justice cause 
You give yourself to working with the homeless. That's great. So you kind of go like, you know, that's a good thing. So you're not going to ask yourself whether that in and of itself also is a way for you to avoid something. Because it's, you know, it's easy if it's like, if it's, if it's how you get taking drugs every night. That's easy to go. I think that's covering over something. When it's working with the homeless, it's, it's more difficult because like, that's, a, that's a righteous and good thing. But it, it still might require you to ask yourself, you know, is there something, is there something beneath that? So I just completely didn't answer your question, I'm sorry, but, those, but it's inspired me to say those things. Even, you know, even good stuff, prayer and fasting and church stuff can itself be a cover for something bad. Um, but, um, but, but, we, but being angry about injustice is, is a good thing. That's what I'm kind of saying, is it's not like, like it's, if, you see, if you see a church is angry about something, that... It, it's good to be angry about something. It's, when, it's whenever the anger seems unjustified, that's the hint. When the anger seems a little bit much, when the anger seems, um, uh, what's that? Out of proportion. These are the hints, you know. Like I say, you can have a healthy conservative community that's, that doesn't like a book. That doesn't look like a symptom. Now, we just don't like Rob Bell's book. We just don't agree with it. And, you know, we've done a couple of sessions about it where we kind of show that this is the stuff that we don't agree with. That's fine. That's not the problem. The problem is the disproportionate thing. Is like, as if like, oh my goodness, they're spending every waking minute attacking this. There's something about that. But yeah, this this is hard in practice, and we'll maybe try and talk about the practice of it in the next couple of sessions a little bit more. But thank you. All right, Ben, over to you. Um, tell us what to do next. How about another hand for Pete? Don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. <laughs> yeah, actually sit down before somebody asks another question. No, no. Try. Uh, so we're going to break for lunch. Um, I actually think I might have a, a, an answer to, to Benjamin's okay. question, but I'm going to follow up with him personally. Yeah. You guys don't get to know. If it's a good um, one, tell us all. Yeah. Uh, so what we have, uh, Jess, who uh, is the uh, administrator around here, made a lovely sheet. It's in color. It says downtown Deland restaurants. There's about 15 of them on the table back there. Grab the one that says restaurants and not bars. And if you want to go to a bar right now, fine by me. Um, some of them even have food, but probably the restaurant's a better way to go. Uh, and the plan is we're just going to break uh, everybody. And the thought is we were going to try and sort of force it and do like some smaller group interaction, but we figured there are some natural breaks throughout the day. So over lunch, uh, sort of mid-afternoon, we'll break for a little extended coffee uh, and then over dinner. Uh, the hope is that, you know, the, the lecture is good, the Q&A is good, but then we also need to take this into some more conversations. Uh, or if you're the kind of person you don't process in a group, go take a walk. Downtown Deland is beautiful. If you just need to be alone in your own head, uh, or if you just need to go eat and not think about anything that was just said for a while in order to be ready to hear a bunch more, however it is you need to process it. Did you do that? Public service announcement, we're going to be getting a new microphone. It doesn't help anyone for this event, but next week we'll have something new that doesn't make that popping noise. Um, although it's actually quite convenient in a long lecture because it, like, if people are starting to tune out, they get right back in. Um, just intermittently, you, you're re reminded, you know, you're here, pay attention. Uh, so a bunch of stuff on here. Um, th the other thing that I would say is uh, raise your hand if you're local and you do the Deland restaurant scene like on a daily, weekly, regular basis. So there's a bunch of us. So if you're in from out of town, um, we would love to, to play host and show you some of the best food in Deland, find somebody local. But we also went ahead and made the list of the best stuff anyway. So um, help yourselves. We got uh, about quarter to noon right now. So if you can scoot and get around before noon, actually it's Saturday, so there probably won't be as significant a lunch rush. But the hope is to get back here around 1. Um, we probably won't start right on time because I think people will be trickling in. But get back as close to 1 as you can um, so the schedule doesn't kind of get, get to lagging. Um, any questions, not like serious, deep <laughs> theological, philosophical questions, any like housekeeping? Oh, for people that were wondering if you came in as we were starting, right through this back door and to the left, there are two restrooms. Um, that's where that stuff is. If you haven't found it yet, that's where it is. Um, I'm trying to think of any other housekeeping stuff we need to do. I think we're good. What? Oh, right. If you haven't registered yet, if you came in and you haven't uh, done the, the suggested donation, there are computers back there. They're, set, they're open to the page, and it says register and pay here. Uh, it would be great if you could help us cover the cost of this. That will also help us to know whether or not we can do it and on what scale next year. So if you're here, uh, and, and I think I know for sure there are some other people that are going to be joining us throughout the afternoon, so we're going to kind of keep saying it. If you're here and you can help us support what we're doing, that would be great. Uh, the registration, 15 bucks, is over there. Um, 
Anything else? Am I forgetting? Jess? Oh, books are going to be for sale after each session. So um, I'm going to run over there right now if you're looking to buy some books. And we've, we've said this a couple times. Uh, Pete gets a much better cut when you guys buy them here in person than if you get them through Amazon. So if you're even thinking about maybe doing it, you can do cash. We can do card. Yeah, and he will autograph them. Yes, that's only $20 more. Um, so uh, <laughs> he's going home on a private jet, actually. <laughs> cool. Any... Uh, any other questions? Ready, go team, break. We'll see you back at one.